All right, so it's uh, 12 15 Eastern Standard Time. I wanted to say uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Gregory Green. Uh, it is an honor and privilege to be with you today. Um, I'm really excited and I hope everyone is, is safe. I pray everyone is safe. That's all that's going on in the world. Um, I work for uh, VMware uh, Pivotal Labs. And uh, today we're going to be talking about it's a pretty long. Uh, title, uh, but we're going to basically be talking about a caching approach to data transformation of legacy relational databases. My team is called Data Transformation, part of VMware Pivotal Labs, and this is what we do. We focus on the data modernization side of app modernization, and I wanted to start out uh, this talk with talking about a particular scenario. So suppose you have a requirement where you want to build some APIs that access an existing data store. Uh, your requirements may look something like this, where uh, this APIs is going to be the back end for some sort of uh, UI user facing application. So the user experience is, uh, is critical, so it has to be as fast as possible. And the data may be some in some existing system of record or some sort of legacy relational database. So you might start out building your microservice-based apps that you can scale out multiple instances of them. But for the first phase, you might leave the existing database or data source as is and establish a direct connection to those data sources. So I'm going to show you kind of what that would look like. So let's the legacy database that's going to represent this particular demo is we're going to use IBM's uh, DB2. And whenever you're talking about uh, modernization, you start to you try to start to identify the domains or the entities uh, that would uh, that will start building features around. For this particular uh, domain, our uh, for this demo. We're going to use the account as our domain context. And we're going to introduce this concept of a repository. Uh, think about a repository as sort of, sort of, it's an interface at the end of the day. And it's called different things in different languages, but it provides the abstraction to do all of the write and read operations within the data store. We're going to have an implementation of this interface that uses. Uh, the, J, the Java Database Connectivity API, JDBC. So we're going to build a solution based on the Java JVM. So we're going to focus on Java. This could easily be replaced with any uh, JVM-based um, uh, language. Uh, we're going to wire in. We have a simple way to wire in the implementation of the repository. And uh, in a Cloud native uh, microservice based fashion. We're going to have an embedded um, uh, web server, in this case, Jetty, to service our interfaces, which is going to be HTTP. So, typically, when we were building this, uh, I, I would typically build this in Spring, but we wanted to show these principles um, in a non Spring example just, so, just to show you that it's not required to use Spring. So we're going to wire that the application to be connected to our uh, DB2, uh, DB2 database and hook up uh, Postman so, so we can test the uh, interface. And then we're going to look at uh, JMeter just to figure out how what sort of performance or response time we're getting from our uh, REST uh, app. Also, with that being said, uh, let's jump to the, uh, to the application. Uh, actually, what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to um, open up my README. So in my README, basically, I need to provide the connection details of, of, the, of the app. How do I connect uh, to the database? And once that is uh, set up, I also have an environment variable that tells me, OK, which instance of the repository that I'm going to use. So I'm going to use the JDBC repository. And then I'll start up the app, and it's an Uber jar. So all of the dependencies are kind of self-contained within the Uber jar. 
So now it's up and running. And let's open up uh, Postman. So for Postman, what we're going to do is we're going to um, write a record using a post operation. So we wrote that record, and then we'll be able to read that record just by specifying uh, the ID that we use to write. So this account object is very simple. We just have uh, three fields. And actually, that's actually a good principle whenever you're doing sort of uh, data modernization. You start out with the minimum number of fields and just build on top of that. Uh, I can look at the data that's actually in my database. So in this case, I'm using the Beaver. Um, so it's using JDBC to access the database. I can execute my, uh, my queries directly against it. So in this case, I see the data that I inserted. OK, so we did a basic read-write operation. So now uh, let's uh, open up uh, JMeter. And then in JMeter, what we'll do is uh, we're going to basically simulate a single user executing the save, read, update operations. It's going to do this uh, 2,000 times. And again, we're just trying to get some uh, baseline numbers on the performance. And it's going to write the report of the average, minimum, max re response time in this tab. So as I'm starting this up, uh, you see the response times. Um, so about 11 seconds, 4 seconds. Um, we can see the app running in the background. So it's doing the, uh, the select and the sort of the, 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 all of the operations to, uh, to interface or access this data within the database. While this is running, let's look at the code. So in the code, we have our uh, repository. Uh, let me expand this. So all right, so here's our repository. So in this uh, repository, again, we're doing the, uh, the CRUD operations, the create, read, uh, update, delete operations, starting with our domain object. And we are executing, we're building our queries, and we're using the JDBC uh, API to map our, our domain object uh, data to the JDBC statements and executing them. Of course, we are doing uh, TDD. So I can look at the tests for this repository. Uh, for test-driven development, the key to building out uh, these tests, these unit tests, is to be able to mock the, everything that the database needs so that I can build my tests of the, how the database is accessed without actually having to stand up a database. So I mock my connections, my prepare statements, and then I, execute, I basically perform my operations. When I'm testing for the create operation, I, I not only check the outputs that I'm getting, but I've also tested I'm using the JB, JDBC uh, APIs as expected. OK, now let's jump back to uh, the performance results. All right, so, so you see that we get in about four to five seconds uh, response times for those operations. Uh, let's clear this out and let's run this again just to see how consistent the results are. And uh, let's continue in the, uh, the demo. All right, so I wanted to highlight some of the potential pain points with, uh, with this uh, scenario. Right. So the, the potential pain points is that even though we're getting at about, you know, five seconds, uh, five milliseconds, I should say, response time, uh, once you start scaling out the number of instances, the number of requests, the requests uh, that could easily be a slow. Right. So you can easily move from milliseconds to a couple of seconds e easily with traditional uh, relational databases. Also, these legacy databases. They're, they're generally hard to scale, right? They, they just want to build to scale. There may be some replication built in for disaster recovery, but they're not able to scale as easily as your microservice-based apps. And also, there may be, besides our new APIs, there may be tons of existing applications uh, that are using this existing database, and it might be providing some critical business need. 
Maybe it's the back end for multiple commercial products. So, for, so from a stakeholder point of view, it may be out of the question to introduce any sort of performance instability into these existing databases. And also, because you have all these dependencies, it may be hard to change those databases to meet any uh, of new requirements that you have for your API. So how do you address this? Well, one way you can address this is to introduce a cache. So thank you, Wikipedia. And the idea of a cache is a data store that allows you to store a future requests in the data so that data can be served faster. It also acts as a buffer layer for some of those risks uh, that we talked about, right? So that we can reduce the risk from introducing sort of performance issues in the database by using the cache. And also we can allow to a change or evolve our cache with our, our updated microservice uh, application API. So the conceptual architecture would look something like this. So if you have a cloud native based uh, platform, if you want to deploy that into any one of these public clouds, or if you want to use some sort of PaaS or platform as a service um, framework, like Cloud Foundry or Kubernetes. Of course, I work for VMware, and we have our Tanzu offering, which provides a flavor of both Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes. So that when you're building your application API layer, uh, you can scale up your number of apps. And instead of having those apps directly connect to the legacy data store, you introduce some sort of data cache layer. And in your data cache layer, you can uh, scale up the number of data nodes or the, the processes that handle and manage the data just as easily as you can the number of apps. And you basically, you, you design a way to synchronize that data from your legacy data source into your data cache, All right? And we're gonna show you how to do that using Apache Geo. All right, so but what is uh, Apache Geo? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> uh, it's basically an in-memory data grid. It could also fall under the category of a NoSQL, but it supports SQL-like operations. Uh, you may have also heard of the uh, product called Gemfire. So uh, Gemfire is the commercial version of Apache Geo, right? Um, and in general, Geo is very fast. Well, the reason why it's so fast is because it accesses all of the data in memory. So we know that uh, uh, memory access is much faster, RAM-based access is much faster than disk-based access. So you can highly optimize your read-write uh, operations. And then many times, we've seen a 10 to 100 times greater performance uh, improvement just by introducing something like Apache Geo. Um, it's very scalable in that you can scale up the number of instances. It's horizontally scalable over a local or a wide area network. All right, some additional fundamentals or uh, sort of uh, one-on-one things about Geo. Uh, you have these core components. You have your cache server. That's the where that's where all of the that's the um, the same as the data node, and then you have these locators. You can think of them as the controller for clients and the cache servers. So when you're starting up a geo, you would normally start up your locator. Uh, then you would start up your cache server. Your cache server would register itself with the locator, and the notion of connected locators and cache servers is becomes your cluster. Um, and then when you're connecting a client, so clients are generally provided with the locator details, and then the locator provides them with the cache uh, server. So a, a client can be connected to any one of these members within the cluster. And you can add as many cache servers as needed to, as you have more and more data, just add more and more cache servers. And they would, again, follow the same process of registering themselves with the locators and discovering other cache servers that are part of the cluster. All right, so in terms of the clients, um, the libraries or the programming languages that are supported, you have Java, you have uh, Node.js, and there's a separate talk on the Node.js uh, interface for Geo. 
you have C++ and you have uh, C Sharp, which can use uh, the C++ native drivers, or you can utilize the REST APIs. So any language, which is just about every language, right, uh, can support anything that can support uh, the REST API can support uh, Apache uh, Geo interface. Sorry about that. Should have uh, muted my phone. All right, and then you have the uh, the REST APIs, right? So, so uh, sorry, and then you have uh, Redis. So any application, any of your REST clients, uh, Geo supports the, Re uh, the Redis APIs. So your existing Redis clients can talk to a Apache Geo cluster. And then you can support a WAN replication, right? So you can have data replicated across data centers, right? So if you have one data center on the East Coast and another data center on the uh, West Coast, you can have that data uh, a bit, uh, uh, replicated in a near real-time uh, fashion so that the data becomes eventually consistent. So that supports your active-active uh, data access or active-passive for disaster recovery across data centers. All right, so now you have uh, another thing we need to talk about, just continuing on the fundamentals, is the idea of a region. So a Gemfire region is similar to a relational database table where you can access the data by a key to get the value. So it's a key value pair, a data structure. So you can get your data out very fast as long as you know the, the key of your, uh, of your entries within your region. But you can also perform um, a SQL-like operations. So for example, if I want to do a select where I wanted to see all of the states that have the key um, in New York or LA, again, that's uh, it looks very much like SQL, right? Just a little bit different, right? You could do that in Apache Geo. It also supports uh, Apache Lucene embedded within Geo. So this allows you to do text-based searches. So think about Google-like uh, searches, right? So for example, if I wanted to see any state that has, I don't know, maybe the word new in it, I could do that easily with uh, Geo. You have events. So when you think about events, uh, they are very similar to triggers in a relational database so that you can have a piece of code that is alerted whenever changes happen to the data. And then you also have a special kind of way to register the, uh, your listeners, which is called a continuous query, which I think is pretty cool. So for example, suppose you have a, a tweets region and you want to be uh, alerted anytime there's any sort of uh, uh, update, create, or delete of a tweet. Uh, you can do that very easily by registering this query, select star from tweets, for example. Uh, Geo supports transactions. So if you are updating multiple regions, suppose you want to update the states in the tweets region with a single unit of work and have them committed or roll back all together, uh, you can do that with Geo. And in that way, you can the use case for Geo is not just limited to a cache. You can actually use it for an operational data store. And then you have uh, data policies that are configured with the region. So you have this idea of a replicated region. Uh, the replicated region is basically each uh, cache server has an exact copy of the data. So if I have two of these cases, and for two records, each cache server would have the copy of the data. Replicated regions are really used for smaller data sets where you want to be able to, I don't know, for example, do uh, joins across multiple tables and you wanna make sure all of that data is uh, co-located within one um, cache server, uh, one JVM, you can do that with replicated regions. But for larger data sets, for something like tweets, you probably want to look at partition regions where uh, each cache server only stores pieces of the data. So if you have more and more tweets, you can add more and more cache servers to, to manage and um, store those tweets. Right? All right, so we talked no more uh, enough about uh, the how-to. Now let's show you a demo. So in this demo, I have a local uh, geo cluster. I only have I have one locator and one cache server, and we're going to use Gfish, which is basically a command line interface to look at and manage our uh, Gemfire cluster. And then we're going to use Postman and JMeter to look at the uh, how to access it and what's the performance look like. 
All right, so let me jump back uh, to my app and I'm going to clear uh, this uh, app. Um, okay. All right. And now let me look at my README. If I go back to my README. I have a way to configure my app now to instead of uh, using the JDBC repository, we're going to use a geo repository. And then we're going to start that right up. So now it's connected to geo. So when I go back to uh, the postman, now let's insert a record. So we insert an account with a count uh, with a number two as the ID. So I can read that out from geo. So now we get a, did a basic read write operation within uh, geo. So now let's look at uh, JMeter. And let's look at what's the performance result from that. So now uh, from Geo. So now let's remember. So now we were getting about three seconds, uh, sorry, three milliseconds, I should say, for the JDBC interface. So we clear this out now. These results are going to be from Apache Geo. So you see, now we went from, and it's already finished. So we went from about uh, three uh, uh, milliseconds to actually under a millisecond's response time. Uh, we can clear this out to see kind of how consistent results are and uh, see the, the results are pretty consistent and that the, the max time to actually uh, uh, significantly reduce. Let's look at some code. So uh, for the code, this is what the geo repository looks like. So as long as I have the, the region object, the Gemfire, uh, so the uh, geo the region object, I can basically just do my CRUD operation directly against that region object. So you see the, the code is a little bit simpler. So we're doing less uh, sort of mapping between, um, you know, between like the JBC statements uh, from our domain object. Really geo just about allows you if you have an object, just store that object, uh, store that object, just give it a key. And if you need to get out that, that object, as long as you have the key, it's no real mapping that it's needed. So the code is much uh, simpler. Okay, so that is Apache Geo. Um, and now let's continue on our talk. So you might have uh, lots of questions. <laughs> I, I imagine one of the questions is, okay, that's great. Now, how do I get my data from my legacy database into the cache? Well, uh, one of the ways or one of the approaches to do that is to introduce uh, what we call like a lazy or just-in-time uh, loading where the data can be loaded as needed. Uh, this approach is good when you are, are typically accessing your data by a key, by an ID, for example, and you need to minimize the amount of data that is stored in the cache. So you can imagine your legacy databases that have been around for a long time, there might be, I don't know, petabytes worth of data. And it might be uh, not feasible uh, to uh, move all of that data onto the cache. So, you know, you can use something, one implementation of this lazy loading is what's called a lookaside cache. So in this case, the app would look for, if you tried to read, if you uh, submit a read request, it would look to see if that data is in the cache already. If it's not in the cache, then it'll read it from the external data source. So uh, let's show you a demo of that. Okay. Um, so actually, let me go back uh, one second. Just go back to here. Okay. All right. So let's go back to the trusty read state, uh, read me. So in this case, uh, I'm going to configure it to use the look aside uh, implementation of the repository. And we'll go ahead and clear this out. Uh, kill this uh, method, clear the screen, and then start that up with the other repository. And let's test this out with Postman. So in Postman, we're going to basically do the same thing, where in this case, we're going to uh, write a new record. 
account number three. And look at what the code is doing. So the, the code, the, the, the basic pattern is it, it makes sure that that record, if you're modifying the, the data, it makes sure that that data is kind of removed from the cache or evicted from the cache. And then it updates this data into the, uh, the database so that if I'm trying to do a read, so now I'll try to get that data out by its ID. So what it did was it tried to read from the cache. It saw that it wasn't in the cache, and then it um, uh, then it uh, read from DB2. And when it read the results from DB2, then it, it put it back into the cache. So that the next time when I try to do a read, uh, next time this will only go from the cache, right? So you see no more uh, SQL statements. So that's one approach. That's the look aside uh, cache uh, approach, uh, which is basically this architecture right here. All right. So now uh, there's the now that's that's there's, there's a couple of let me actually go back. So there's a couple of different problems with this uh, approach. Uh, the problem is now the app. There's more complexity built into the app. The app now needs to know how to talk to the cache layer and to the JDBC layer, right? And also, uh, if data is not in the cache, you basically you can still get that slow response time for the initial loads of the data. So uh, uh, one way to address this is to introduce some sort of data pipeline. So the data pipeline is basically a set of, um, of processes that would make sure that the cache is up to date, right? It can use a, a, a batch approach where you basically, every once in a while, maybe based on the schedule, you update the data from the legacy database into the cache, or you can use a streaming approach, which is basically the app is always running, always looking for changes in the external database to push to the cache. And we're gonna show you both approaches. Let's see how we're doing on, on time. Um, I think uh, actually we might be running a little bit low on time. Um, all right, so uh, the initial approach is well, I'm going to show you the batch based approach. Right? So in the batch based approach, let's go ahead and I have um, I have my data pipeline all ready to go. So this is my data pipeline app. So when I start this up, this is basically going to let me. Um, make sure that the, you can see all of the screen. Okay, so when I started this up, it basically tried to see if there are any changes in the database. It didn't detect any changes, so it basically immediately sent that over. Uh, basically, it, it, it didn't find any records. So we can uh, insert some new records into the uh, database just by using um, our SQL editor. So let's go ahead and insert a new record into the database. So now when we run the batch again, again, it should pick up that, that new record and move that over uh, to Geo. And uh, actually let's open up, uh, which I didn't show you, this is the, uh, the, G, the, the GFish client. So in GFish, I could do things like doing a query. So I can look at all of the data that is in my region, which is called accounts. So I can see the data that we just uh, inserted, right? The, the, the number four record that we just inserted. All right. So the other, the other approach I wanted to show you before we open this up for questions. Um, I don't know if, uh, I think I got a moderator to be able to open this up for questions. But um, now we're going to show you the streaming approach. So in the streaming approach, we're going to have this uh, a source app. And this is, again, always running, uh, looking for trying to detect changes in the DB2 uh, database. And in this case, it's going to push all of the changes to Kafka. And we have a separate app, a sync app, which is looking for uh, events that's pushed to Kafka to store that into the Apache Geo uh, cache. And our apps are just going to configure to just look at Apache Geo. You may be asking, why would you want to do an approach like this? Well, one of the reasons is if you want to have future apps uh, to be able to tap into the stream for future requirements, you can introduce something, an architecture like this. 
All right, so let's go back uh, to our app. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, stop the app so that I can now um, start it up with the um, uh, go back to just looking at Apache Geo. Okay, so I'll copy that. And now we start this up. So now it's looking at Geo. And uh, in our pipelines, uh, actually, this while streaming, we'll have a, a streaming source app at the top. So we'll start that up. So this guy is always basically just looking for changes within uh, the database. So uh, it basically uh, it checks for changes uh, every uh, five seconds. And, and here, this is the sync. So this is just looking for any data that's been pushed to Apache uh, uh, Kafka. So that if we go back into our database and we insert a new record, for example, uh, we should see that new record basically gets detected and gets sent over to uh, Geo. So if I go back to GFish, I'll see the account number five. All right. So the, the good thing about this is um, it's actually always it's always looking for changes. So it's kind of keeping everything uh, up. Uh, up to date, all of the database information uh, up to date. And even if I update existing records, like if I go back and, I don't know, change uh, uh, the accounts uh, one through four, um, I, if I go back to the cache, the stream, I should see uh, all of those updates uh, got detected. So you see we got three uh, updates were detected, and they all now synchronized within uh, Geo. Okay, so uh, I, that's pretty much the end of the presentation. Um, I don't know if we can um, open it up for questions. Do I have a moderator? Oh, be, actually, before I do that, uh, one thing I just wanted to sort of to to wrap this up and put a put a bow around everything is uh, let me share this. Share one more time. All right, so we showed you that uh, for Apache Geo introducing the cache, we should we have in a, we can introduce low latency for the data access. Uh, we can scale up the number of data nodes because it's kind of built into Geo. And we can also isolate the data access just by moving data into the cache. And again, now the cache should be able to easily evolve uh, just as easily as um, as the applications are. And all of the code is available on my personal uh, page. So if you go to my uh, my GitHub, you can see a, a caching uh, on uh, relational database uh, transformation project. And you can follow me on uh, Twitter and LinkedIn. OK, great. That's pretty much the end of our demo. All right, it's basically looking at the chat. Do we see any, question, uh, any questions in the chat? All right, don't see the questions yet. All right, with that being said, everybody have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.